But I pray for his disciples, lest they wind up in hell. And I'm sure that old Mohammed thought he knew the way. But it won't be Hare Krishna, we stand before on the judgment day. No, it won't be old Buddha that's sitting on the throne. And it won't be old Mohammed that's calling us home. And it won't be Hare Krishna that plays that trumpet tune. And we're going to see the sun not reverend moon. Well, I don't hate anybody, so please don't take me wrong. But there really is a message in this simple song. You see, there's only one way, Jesus, if eternal life is your goal. And meditation of the mind, it won't save your soul. Cause it won't be old Buddha that's sitting on the throne. And it won't be old Muhammad that's calling us home. And it won't be Hare Krishna that plays that trumpet tune. Baptist and not be born again, a Presbyterian or a Methodist, and still die in your sin. You can't even be a charismatic, shout and dance, and jump a pew. But if you hate your brother, you won't be one of the chosen few, cause it won't be a Baptist that's sitting on the throne, a Presbyterian or a Methodist that's calling us home. And it won't be a charismatic that plays that trumpet tune. So let's all just live for Jesus, because he's coming back real soon. Oh, it won't be old Buddha that's sitting on the throne. And it won't be old Muhammad that's calling us home. And it won't be Hare Krishna that plays that trumpet tune. And we're going to see the sun and not Reverend Moon. And we're going to see the sun and not Reverend Moon. Not Reverend Moon. Now, coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker, as long as I'm pushing the right buttons, this is Pastor Mike, and I'm online and I am live with you today. I've been sitting here just ready, just ready to go. We had an outstanding meeting last night with our second annual Midwest Bible Conference. Chris Pinto came in and uh, did did an excellent job. He did, he nailed it as far as what the Lord laid on my heart. And and I'll tell you, the last, if you saw last night, the last graphic that he put up on the screen was a statue of Lord Protectorate Oliver Cromwell. If you know anything about British history, you know that for a few years, they had no king. Oliver Cromwell assassinated the king of England and took over and ruled not as king but as lord protectorate because his he said there's no king except Jesus and um, but anyway they erected a statue of him in the 1800s with a bible in one hand and a sword in the other and when chris pinto was was talking about that very thing in uh, Fargo this year 
up until that point, I was not sure on what direction I was going to go with this year's second annual Midwest Bible Conference. I wasn't sure who I was going to try to have come. I wasn't sure of the theme or anything like that. And when, when Chris began to talk about the relationship between the Bible issue and the Second Amendment, the human citizen's right given to him by his creator to defend himself against murderers, robbers, thieves, rapists, and tyrants. When he started talking about that connection, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, this is, this is what I want. And I mean, as soon as Chris got done off the stage, I went to him. Chris, let's me and you talk about coming back to Festus, Missouri this year. And, um, and I told him where I was going with it, how the Holy Ghost had, had led me to include the issue of the Second Amendment with our Bible conference this year. And um, the presentation that he gave last night was just outstanding. Um, I talked to him. He is staying here at the church uh, in a in another secret compound, and um, I I we talked about um, his presentation tonight. He and Pastor Reg Kelly uh, are going to be speaking tonight. You pray right now for Reg. He is on his way up here. And it is storming to beat the band right here in the state of Missouri. Uh, thunderstorms are everywhere right now. And uh, so pray for him as he travels. But anyway, both of them are speaking tonight. And I talked to Chris uh, when I called him. He said, I, he said, I am right in the middle of studying for my presentation tonight. And he said, I am so excited. And he said, I can't wait to get up there and 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 give out what God is putting into me today. And he said, do you want me up there at noon? I said, Chris, I know how it goes. If you feel like you need to stay with your study, then you do that. And so I left it open to him. We had talked about him being on the program today with me. I have another microphone sitting like right here waiting for him. And uh, if he happens to step in anytime between now and 2 p.m., then um, we'll uh, sort of change the direction of the program. But what, I've, what I have in my mind today um, is I'm, I, God showed me something again this morning, just studying his word. God led me in a series of thoughts. That's how it works. That's, you, you, you always talk about how the Holy Ghost moves and how, the, how God speaks to you and so on. It is, a, it is a series of thoughts that God leads you in that when you compare those with Scripture, you know that they're true. And God showed me something um, that I've actually added on to the presentation called the Ultimate King James Code Series. I've done two parts. I've got part three in the works right now. And God showed me something brand new with that this morning. And I'm just, I'm just like giddy. Anyway, uh, so we're going to talk about, it has to do with DNA. We're going to talk about DNA. And there's some news going on about CRISPR. Uh, I have a magazine that was sent by one of our watchers. And it's called a Life Extension magazine from, um, uh, let's see, it's called The Ultimate Source for New Health and Medical Findings from Around the World, lifeextension.com. And there's articles in here. Let's see, when was this put out? I'm going to say I got this in, yeah, 2016. And um, it's April, in fact, two years ago. So in this magazine, there is an article about editing our human genome while we are still alive. In other words, you can edit the human DNA in an embryo and that embryo then would be permanently altered and it would grow into a human being. They were talking two years ago about the possibility 
of being able to edit the human genome of a already living being, a, a human being. In other words, an adult, 40, 50 years old, I, I'll be 52 this month, and they're talking about the probability of after me living 50 years of life with one genetic code, altering and rewriting my entire genome from beginning to end and altering thousands of different genes that are in my body all at once. This article was talking about it two years ago, and it was talking about the CRISPR, uh, the CRISPR method of altering genes. And so if we get a chance, we're going to talk about that today. I'm going to show you how it works and some new information that has come across just today about their ability to alter every form of life on this planet. And I'm not kidding you. I, uh, this, is not, this is not hyperbole. This is not uh, e exaggeration. I'm telling you that the CRISPR gene editing uh, conspiracy is without a doubt the, I have no doubt in my mind that it is directly related to the mark of the beast. Think about what happened to Nebuchadnezzar for seven years. For seven years, Nebuchadnezzar was in every way altered to be a beast. And he ate like a beast. He looked like a beast. He lived like a beast, like a wild animal. Not in his, he had no, the, the, there was very little resemblance of humanity in him at all. And, and the Bible specifically says, let a beast heart be given to him. And I believe that there is coming to humanity at the time of harvest, Matthew 13, Harvest is all about transformation. Harvest is when a green apple turns red. It is when a green orange turns orange. It's when a green tomato turns red. It's when fruit or wheat or whatever it is, it's when it transforms. That's harvest. That's when you know that's ready to harvest. And the story of the, of the wheat and the tares, Jesus knew exactly, because he was the creator. He knew exactly what he was talking about. He knew that the wheat and the tares, both of them were green while they were growing. And it was very, very difficult to establish the difference between the two. But in harvest, there was a transformation green wheat stalks became golden like the sun. They shined like the sun. They took on the image of the Son of Righteousness, Jesus Christ. We are going to be transformed, the Bible says, into His glorious image. The world, on the other hand, is going to be transformed as well. But when tares or poison darnel when it is ready for harvest, when it ripens, it turns black. It is just the opposite of wheat. But the idea is, is that at harvest, there is a transformation, a change of its appearance. And so I believe that all of humanity, saved and lost, is going to be transformed the lost world is going to be changed with corruptible seed. Something is going to corrupt every human species on this planet. Every one of mankind, human, homo sapien, is going to be altered and transformed into homo novus or 
uh, homo nexus or whatever. They, these words that they keep popping up with to describe the transformation of man that is coming five years, 10 years, 20 years, how long will it take? The way they're advancing in their ability to change and alter DNA. If I said, if I said two years ago that the transformation was going to take place, let's say in 20 years, two years later, I'm now, I'm not saying it's going to take place now in 18 years. I'm saying two years later that it could happen in as little as 10 years or maybe closer than that. Who knows? I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows except God. And he hasn't said anything yet. But I believe he will. So let's talk DNA. Let's talk about how, and I love this topic. I love talking about it because it's directly related to the Bible issue. How does, what, what effect does this Bible have on a person's life? We know according to the scriptures, we know according to the parable of the seed and the sower, that the sower goes forth and soweth the seed, and the seed that falls on good ground, well, that seed then, 1 Corinthians 15, what you put in the ground isn't what comes up out of the ground. What comes up out of the ground is something entirely different. The Whatever was designed in that seed, that body that comes up is, is glorious, absolutely glorious. So how does that work? How does the Word of God going into a person's heart by way of their ears, them listening, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, how does that transform someone? Let's say someone who used to be an atheist, someone who used to be uh, a reprobate, someone who was just into fornication, into drugs, into alcohol, into, I mean, lascivious lifestyle. They were everything. And I have seen this transformation in people. I've seen this change. How does, how does a book alter a human being's ability to conquer sin in their life? What, how does that transform them? All right? And it's done, the, the way it's done in DNA, how does a strand of DNA become one of the members of our body? And I like to, I use the illustration of, we're going to go to um, our PowerPoint here, PowerPoint du jour, PowerPoint of the day. How does, where does the insulin come from and what does insulin do? Now remember, insulin is a Levite priest in our bodies, in the, in the, uh, in the allegory of the metaphor of the body, the symbolism of the human body, the body being the tabernacle of God, we are the temple, and every cell in our body is a picture of the tabernacle. You have the cell membrane or cell wall in vegetation. You have the cell membrane, which is the curtain around the tabernacle itself. You have the sanctuary, which is the um, nucleus of the cell. Inside the sanctuary is a copy of the book. Incidentally, but not accidentally, the sanctuary itself was built of 46 boards that made that building and where the book was contained. Your book of DNA is contained in 46 chromosomes. How did Moses know how many boards to make it with? God told him. So here is a beautiful, perfect picture of the, of the nucleus of the cell being the sanctuary of God, the most holy place where the book of the law was kept. That's your DNA in 46 chromosomes. And then you have the mitochondria. Mitochondria is what produces the energy for every cell. The, the mitochondria is the reason why your body is at 98.6 degrees right now. Every cell in your body is burning. It's got a little fire going in it. Just because there's a little snow on the roof doesn't mean there ain't a fire in the furnace. And so the mitochondria is the altar of sacrifice. When food was brought to the tabernacle, food, 
lambs, goats, bullocks, fine flour, olive oil, everything that's edible, those things were brought. They didn't bring rocks and, and pieces of iron, said, here's our sacrifice. You can't eat those. They brought things that you could eat. And the Levite priest actually got to be recipients of the leftovers. That's how they, that's how they ate. That's how they fed their families. So anyway, picture every cell in your body and you have a mitochondria, which is the altar. Mitochondria burns sugar. How does the sugar go from the blood to inside the cell? That's the job of insulin. Insulin is this chemical in your body. It's the only thing in your body that can open up the cell wall. Because in the cell wall are what's called insulin receptors. Think of a lock in a door. And the only key to that lock is insulin. Think of in the tabernacle, there was a priest standing outside the cell wall, outside of the gate. And as people brought sacrifices, an animal or fine flour and olive oil and whatsoever, as they brought those things to the priest, the priest would examine them. And if they found them that they were without spot and they were clean and they had met all the qualifications that God set forth, then it was the, it, only the priest could open the tabernacle or the sanctuary wall and allow that sacrifice, that animal or whatever it was, to go inside of that, and then the, the priest would take it over to the altar for it to be burned. That's what insulin does. Insulin is the only thing in your body that can open up the cell wall and allow the sugar to pass through so it goes into the mitochondria to be burned. So the question is, where do we get insulin from? Well, ask the question, where did, where did the Levite priest come from? The Levite priest came from the very law that God had stored inside of the tabernacle. It was God telling Moses was a Levite. Moses' brother Aaron was the first high priest. And so through the tribe of Levi, it was the law that dictated that all of these Levites would come and they would all have their course, they would all have their particular uh, ministry, their particular job and so on. But it was the law that dictated that. It was the DNA that decided who, get to, who gets to be the priest that... Um, that goes into the most holy place. Who's the one who gets to allow the animals to go in to be sacrificed? So it's DNA that makes insulin. We don't, and I've got a list of foods up here that I like. I like fried chicken and I like butter pecan ice cream. I like beans and cornbread. I like cheeseburgers. I like a little diet mountain. Of course, I'm not drinking any soda right now, but I, like, I could put up their tea. I like iced tea. D is insulin contained in any of the things that we eat? The answer is no. There's nothing that we eat that contains insulin that our body then extracts from the food and puts it to work in our bloodstream. So how, how do we get, if, we, if, we, if the things that we eat do not contain insulin, if the air that we breathe does not contain insulin, if the water that we drink does not contain insulin, then how do we get insulin? And we need it. <clears throat> it is one of those members of our body. We need it. If I had my left hand cut off because of some infection or whatever, I could live without my left hand. If I had my eyes plucked out, I could live without my eyes. I can't live without insulin. I can't do it. Without insulin, the cells in my body would starve literally to death. I would go into a diabetic coma and... With no insulin in my body, the sugar would build up so high and the sugar 
once it finds a cell, just starts pounding on those cells. Those who have diabetes, who have a regular problem with regulating the sugar in their body, the reason why they suffer eye problems or heart damage or whatever is because the sugar is literally beating their cells to death, trying to get in, ramming the doors, as it were, and it damages soft tissue. The eyes, usually the eyes go first. And so anyway, but back to the question, where, where if I don't have insulin, I can't live. So where's that insulin going to come from? It, it's going to be made, the insulin, the, the formula, the recipe for insulin is in my DNA. There is a segment in every living human being's DNA. There is a section of your DNA that specifies how to make insulin out of the various proteins that you did eat. I mean, in a way, the building blocks for insulin are in the things that we put into our body. But our body has to know how to take the various proteins that we consume and build the member of our body called insulin. So how does the coding of insulin in my DNA, how does it become the protein of insulin? How does that actually work? Or how is it that a Bible creates a saint of the Most High God. And I'm going to say this. You can be mad at me if you want to. If your name is not in the book of life, you're not a saint of the Most High God. If the Bible does not make you a saint, you're not a saint. No church. Think about the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church says that they are the only ones who have the right to make and create saints. That's a lie. If the Bible does not make you a child of God, you are not a child of God. If the Bible doesn't save you, you're not saved. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It's that simple. But how then does the Bible, let's, let's say the original Bible, the one written by Jeremiah or Isaiah or Mark or the Apostle John. John writes John 3.16. How does that verse that John wrote in Greek 2,000 years ago, how does it work to become a saint of the Most High God? How does it create Christians? How does it make church members? This is where it gets absolutely fascinating. This is stunning to me. When I, when I learned about this, I was in awe of how... Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. How God works here is how God works there. there God is always the same in, in what he does and how he does it. Always the same. And you're going to love this. The first thing that happens. How does my body produce insulin? There is a, let's say that in my DNA, there's the formula for what proteins need to be brought together, and then the, the manual on how those proteins must be folded and made into insulin. All of the formula is there in the DNA. But my DNA is rolled up like a scroll, and it's, clo it's a closed book. So how does, if I need insulin, how does my body going to produce it from a book that's rolled up and closed. The first process is called DNA transcription or RNA transcription. And what happens is the DNA is going to make a copy of the part of my genetic makeup, the part of my DNA that specifies how to make insulin. My body is going to make a copy of that part 
DNA transcription is precisely what happens when a person's life is changed by the Word of God. You may have noticed that since you've been saved, God is not done when God saved you. God didn't just pull his hands off and say, okay, you're on your own till you die. God has always been busy working on you and work and changing things in you. Has he not? And the changes that have been made in you, God has made them. And how has he made them? He's always made them through his word. And if his word did not change you, you're not changed the right way. If, if God's DNA did not produce the right kind of fruit in your life, if it wasn't God's word, you weren't changed, my friend. You're still the same old slobby sinner you used to be. When you look back and see all the changes that God has made in your life, he's done it through his word. He's done it with this process right here. So let me show you DNA transcription according to the scripture. Deuteronomy 17. <clears throat> it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that she, he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes, and do them. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children, in the midst of Israel. Right here, you're seeing that God dictated that if there was a king on the throne, that he had to take and write out a copy of the book. He was to not take the original. He had to leave the original the way it was. He had to write him a copy of this law in a book. Now, if this king was evil and he's writing out his copy, he sees something that he doesn't like, what does his nature do? His nature says, let's leave that out. That way I don't. If it's not in my book, so I don't have to do it. Right now, you think about all of these manuscripts that popped up in the 1800s from the Vatican, the Vaticanus Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus manuscript, the one these scholars froth all over and say, oh, these are the better manuscripts. Let's let's make our Bibles about these manuscripts instead of the 5000 manuscripts that uh, underlie the King James. Well, with those manuscripts, you had the guys copying transcribing those original Greek manuscripts that the original writers wrote, they're transcribing them and they see things in there that they don't like, so they left them out. They see things like, this kind goes not out but by prayer and fasting. Well, they didn't like that, so they left it out. Acts chapter 8, verse 37, 1 John uh, 5, 7. They left verses, they left whole words, phrases out. Whole sections. Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. They left him out because they didn't like it. So there are things when people read these other Bibles, there are th significant things left out of them. They cannot be the same kind of people that are, how can I say this? They're not the same as those who read and believe the King James and other translations in other languages like it from the, from the manuscript line the King James comes from. That must be transcribed exactly perfect. So let me show you this. This is, this is so cool. Here is your DNA. It's rolled up like a scroll, and it's sealed. There's a book in God's right hand. I, I don't know if I have the, yeah, I've got that coming up. I'll show it to you. I'll walk you through the process. I'll show it to you in the scripture. Here's your DNA. It's rolled up like a scroll, and it's sealed. Something must unseal the book and open it up so that the part of your DNA that has insulin in it so that that can be transcribed. So what happens is 
there is this machine called RNA polymerase. And it moves and it just constantly reads the book. And when the signal comes to the RNA polymerase that, it, that the body needs insulin, the RNA polymerase quickly goes to the place where insulin is encoded. And what it does is it breaks the hydrogen bonds. It unseals. It breaks open the seals of the book. Then it unwinds the book. It opens it. It makes, watch this now, that which is crooked is made straight. Woo! Then, once it has that opened up and straightened out, it starts copying it. One base pair at a time. Well, this is adenine, so this must be thymine. This is cytosine, so this must be guanine. This is thymine, so this must be adenine. Because it knows the rules. If it sees cytosine here, it must be guanine. So it writes down guanine here. If it sees adenine, it writes down thymine here. Because that's how it's transcoded. And so it's transcripted. The word transcription literally means writing a copy of it, scribing it out. Trans means going from one to the other, like transportation. And so every word of your DNA that makes insulin, every word of it is copied out exactly perfect. And get this, this little, let me get my pen here. I like my pen. This little piece here, of RNA, RNA is single strand. DNA is double strand. All right, it could it could come from DNA, but if it's a single strand, it's RNA. This little this little strand of RNA is a copy of the words of your genetic book that make insulin. This strand of RNA has a name. It's not Bob or Phil or anything like that. It's called messenger. Messenger RNA. Because what it's doing, it literally is a message from the book of DNA to the recipient. And the recipient is your body that needs the insulin that that messenger RNA is going to create. I love this. I love this. And by the way, when the messenger RNA has been transcribed perfectly, then the RNA polymerase puts the seals back. It seals the book back together and, clo and rolls it back up, closes the book. Luke chapter 4. That is exactly what Jesus did. In Luke chapter 4, he's the messenger of the covenant, people. He is, a, he is God's angel. That's what the word angel means. Angel means messenger. Jesus is God's, he is God angel. The angel of the Lord. And he is the messenger of the covenant. And when you see him in Luke 4, he's not taking and reading the whole Bible and saying, it's all fulfilled now. No, because it's not time for certain things in God's word to be fulfilled. It's not time. Just like in your DNA. When you are eight or nine years old, it's not time for you to be thinking about babies, getting married, right? But then your DNA, at a certain time of your life, your DNA starts opening parts of the DNA that have never been opened before, never been unsealed. It's called puberty. And your body goes through that change, that transformation into adulthood because it was written in the DNA exactly, exactly when to do this, right? Did God have an exact time for the flood of Noah? Yep, he had an exact 
time for it. Did God have an exact time for the Babylonian captivity? Yep. Daniel read it. Daniel read in Jeremiah that he's going to be there 70 years. And at the end of 70 years, it happened exactly the way God said it was going to happen. It was all in the DNA. And so Jesus stands up in Luke chapter 4, and he, he took the book of the prophet Isaiah, 66 chapters in Isaiah, 66 books in your Bible. It's a match. It's a connection. And he opened the book. He took and he broke the seals, and he opened the book just like just like RNA polymerase does. And he says in verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. And if you, I've made this point before, but if you go back and look in Isaiah 61, Jesus closed it mid-sentence. He found a comma. And he paused and he closed the book. Why? Because what follows uh, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, what follows that, it wasn't time yet. Just like adulthood, it's not time yet for a nine-year-old boy to all of a sudden hit adulthood. He's not ready for it mentally. It's not time yet. And so Jesus closed the book when he wanted to close the book. And then he said, you know, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And what he said, what Jesus said from verse 18 to verse 19, and then later on when it says, this, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears, exactly 66 words. Exactly. It's a prototype of what Jesus is going to do in the last days. Jesus cannot do anything outside of the book. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Just as your body cannot produce something as a member of your body that's not in the DNA, so Jesus cannot do anything that's not in the book. When will people get that through their head? When will this lost, dying world. When will the churches understand that Jesus doesn't work outside of the book? Because we get ridiculed. We get mocked. We get called names. Bible worshipers, idolaters. They say, you limit God. God's not limited to The Bible? What, you believe in the fourth part of the Trinity because you believe the Bible? We get made, we get called so many things because we say that if Jesus does it, it's in the book. And if it's not in the book, Jesus didn't do it. Neither did the Holy Spirit. That's what we believe. But you've got churches all... Not even Pentecostal churches, just church emergent churches, churches that are liberalizing, socializing, being community churches. You know what that you know what the community church is? Communist. It's the idea that everybody we all have to be the same. Anyway, they they are spreading this idea that believing only the Bible limits God. No, God is the one who dictated that when his son does the work of the father, he does it according to the book. It's just like believing that you're going to grow an extra finger when it's not in your DNA to do that. Or it's like, like Jesus said, just thinking that you can add 18 inches, a cubit, one cubit to your stature just by thinking it. But it's not in your DNA to do that. Your DNA determines how tall you are. And it's not there. So just thinking that you're going to be a cubit taller than you are, if it's not in the book, you're not growing. Period. It's that Simple people, and it's DNA transcription. Whatever the book says 
to be done, that's what's going to be done. And since God is the one who wrote each and every one of us, God wrote us a unique book that only belongs to us as individuals. If God wrote each and every one of those, what right do we have to go in after God did that and rewrite it simply because we didn't like it? You are no better than the Bible scholars who've accepted the West Cotton Hort Greek text saying that it is in fact superior to the Textus Receptus or even the majority text even though it omits thousands of words. Think of how many genes are not in these other Bibles. It numbers in the thousands. If I said, well, between this Bible and this Bible, there's only like one letter difference, you'd say well, that's probably not a big deal. But if I said between this Bible and this Bible, there are thousands of words that are missing. Or if I said medical science wants to take your son, rewrite his DNA, they're going to take out thousands of things in your child's DNA. Or why not let somebody take out things out of your will? Or why not let somebody take things out of your, your, uh, the title to your house? Or why not let somebody you have a contract with rewrite the contract without your knowledge or approval? Why not? It's the same thing. So here we have the book in God's right hand, sealed with seven seals. Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. Let me move through some of this. Isaiah 22, 22, And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. That is exactly what RNA polymerase does. RNA polymerase is the only thing in the whole body that can open and close DNA. It's the only thing. And if the RNA polymerase doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. Man, I love this. Look at this. In Nehemiah chapter 8, all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. So in verse 5, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Your, that book is powerful. That book is alive. Your Bible is alive, people. I mean, what is it that decides whether you even need insulin? The book. The book decides that. The DNA does. The DNA is what keeps your body alive. It's what regulates every part of your body. The blood system, endocrine system, respiratory system, digestive system, circulatory system, nervous system. Every system in your body is made, manufactured, and regulated by a central source, and that is your DNA. And here in the days of, of Ezra, the scribe, the people come back from Israel. They had, had, they've not had the book open for 70 years. And they come back and Ezra stands in front of the people and he opens the book in the sight of all the people. He's acting out Christ opening the book. He's acting out RNA polymerase. Because what Ezra is going to do is he's going to restore the law. How is it when they came back from Babylon, nobody remembered how to do the temple sacrifices. Nobody remembered how. If it wasn't for Ezra, preserving God's word during that time, they'd have come back lost. 
And so what did God want done? God wanted his law restored. And so he raised up Ezra to stand and open the book. And he read the law to those people. Look, I love this. He caused the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book and the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading of it. He interpreted it for them. That's another part. I'll get to that in a little bit. But as Ezra's reading the law, the law is going out, and now they're saying, okay, we need Levites. We, who are our Levites? Levites, come over here. We need you guys. The law says you're the priest, so you, Levites, you have to start doing this because this is what the law said. And all of a sudden, temple sacrifices are being made again. Things are, are, are working the way they used to. Because of the DNA, it was transcripted. He opened the book of the law, read it, and it happened. Think about what God said about his word. The word that I speak, when it goes forth, my word does not return to me void. If I, if I send out my word by way of DNA transcription, if that messenger RNA is copied out correctly, I guarantee you it's going to produce insulin. It never fails to accomplish what I sent it to do. My friends, my love for you and for this book, I want you and God's word to be drawn together ever closer every day. Because all I want out of your life is for you to know and understand that whatever it is that you need in life, God already knows about it. And God's answer for your needs and his supply for your needs is in his word. And no other. There's nothing else in your body that can produce insulin. Jesus looked at his disciples. To, Will you also leave? Peter said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter recognized that there was no other way for him to have what he had other than through Jesus Christ, the word of God, the book of God, the DNA, the seed. So this is how it works. It has to be copied, and it has to be copied correctly. It's... 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word. Preachers, we're the messengers of the covenant. We're to take this book. We don't preach the whole Bible every sermon. We take selected portions of it. God gives, God lays on our heart a burden. God sort of gives us an idea of what our body, the church, needs. And we respond by doing exactly what DNA does. Taking small portions of the Word of God every time we preach. I mean, what I'm giving you today, God laid on my heart to do that. Somebody needs this. Somebody needs to hear this. Somebody needs to know this. Mike, you need to give them DNA transcription again. You need to do... And I love it. But preachers, when you preach the Word of God to your people, it is the Word of God that will change them. Not you. You're just the messenger. You're the messenger of the covenant. You're that messenger RNA that takes the portion of God's word that God has given you for those people for that sermon, and you preach that word. You give them the sense and the meaning of it, and all of a sudden, God's, God's word is working in their life. Do not, preachers, do not expect instantaneous results. Wait for God's word to work. Just because they didn't come down bawling their eyes out at the end of your message every Sunday doesn't mean that it's not working. God taught me that a long time ago. You guys know, if you watch me on Sunday, I may not lead us in an altar call every Sunday service. But I always open it up, leave it open, but... I quit demanding instantaneous results out of all my messages. I just know that if I give them God's word, it's going to make a change in their life. 
It's the word that'll do it, not me, not my sermon, not how I preach it. It's always the word that's going to do it. For the word of God is quick. You know what that means? It means it's alive. Does the Bible really mean that? <sighs> Listen, your DNA is more alive than you are. You're, you're, you're courting death every second of life, and it's the DNA that's keeping you alive. The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It even mentions joints and marrow there. Those are, those are two things that are produced by DNA. Your bone marrow, the joints, the things that connect your joints together, those, those are all, all ordered by your DNA. Ah, there it is. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing wherein I sent it to do. Look at, I mean, look at, that is messenger RNA. Whatever, Whatever messenger RNA is sent forth to do, it does. And you don't have to make it do it, do you? You don't have to think and make yourself make insulin, do you? In fact, that's not even part of your thought processes every day. And yet you're kept alive by DNA. You're kept alive by the book that God wrote for you. It's producing other things in your body, DNA. It's, it, it's producing blood cells, skin cells. It's providing nerve cells. It's providing everything essential to keep you alive. And it's doing it without you giving a thought to it. There is something about you that is way higher than you and your thinking. It's the book that God wrote in you. My goodness. Man, I love this. So think about Adam. How did you and I get here? Adam made us. I am Adam. You are Adam. I, I mentioned the first time the word book is used in the Bible. It's the book of the generations of Adam. And in Genesis 5, you see Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image. Called his name Seth. Well, Seth, after Adam died, Seth is still alive, isn't he? Adam's genes lived on. He handed, he made, <laughs> he made a copy of his book handed it down to Seth and to his other ch hundreds of children, probably. And they all procreated. They all made copies of the book that Adam, their father, gave them, handed it down to their children, who handed it down to their children. And you and I and every living being on this planet, some 7 billion people right now, if you were to take all of us and put us together, you've got Adam. You see, because God preserves copies of the original manuscripts. The proof is in the fact that on the day when God created horses, that would be on day six, horses are still around from those original horses. When God created elephants on day six, we still have elephants. And all the elephants look alike. When God created monkeys on day six, there's still monkeys today. Their DNA has been passed down through countless thousands of generations. God created mosquitoes. What day did he create mosquitoes? Creeping things. Okay. When God created those, they're still around. The original DNA of mosquitoes still in operation, still to be found to this day. Adam, still alive in every human being. God preserved the original manuscripts by making exact copies of them. Do you understand where I'm going with this? Why, why not believe that God can preserve copies of his word? Why not believe that? When the fact of it is that throughout humanity, 
a copy of Adam's DNA is still preserved to this day. So, Ezra, how, how does this, think of those tattered old manuscripts, become copies? Someone transcribed them. They were called scribes in the Bible. Ezra was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. Colossians 4.16, when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Well, how did the Laodiceans get a copy? Well, I just said it. How did they get the book from the, for the Colossians? It was copied and, and sent there. Copied word for word. Do you think that Paul, telling the Colossian church, now send a copy of this to the Laodiceans, do you think anybody in that church said, well, I don't have to write it out exactly, do I? Are you kidding me? Those people knew that that was the word of God. They had to read. He said, cause that it be read. This epistle, cause that it be read in the church of the Laodiceans. This very epistle. So when they copied it, they copied it exactly. Just like in DNA transcription. Revelation 111. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches. Was there only one book that had to be shared amongst the seven churches? No. Seven books. All of them transcribed from the original and then sent out the churches. Now think about it. When John sends this letter to the seven churches, he's making seven copies, right? Which one of these churches got the original? Probably none of them. Because probably, I mean, we're just guessing, but John probably would have retained the original. John had uh, disciples under him. Um, I think Irenaeus was one. Can't remember. But anyway, John had his, t his students, his helpers, and they probably retained the original, made copies, made seven copies, sent it to those churches. Those churches did not get the original. They got copies. And yet, those copies were regarded by those churches as the Word of God. I'm here in, uh, in, in uh, 2 Timothy. In, in, yeah, in 2 Timothy, Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15 that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. What did Timothy have? He had copies. He said, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee, make thee wise. How does Timothy get wisdom? It was the Holy Scriptures that produced wisdom in him, that made wisdom in him. It was the transcribed word going into Timothy's life that made him what he was as a bishop, as a pastor. Paul knew the power of of God's word. And so he followed it up by saying all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine every, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If the man of God does good works, it's because the word of God performed it in him. Not the man himself. The credit goes to the word that did that provided the good works. That man of God is truly furnished. That means completely furnished by the scriptures. Just like in your body. If your body needs something and there's not a DNA encoding for it, you're not going to get it. It's that simple. Unless the book says it to be, it doesn't happen. So, if this is not transcribed right, transcripted right, I should have said transcribed right, there will be no insulin. In fact, there will be poison. If an error is produced from transcribing 
if it doesn't transcribe it perfectly correctly, if an error is produced, then it could very well make poison. There are certain genetic defects that there are people's bodies that produce toxins. The reason why they do is that there is something not written right in their DNA. And instead of it producing something that benefits the body, it's producing something that is harming the body or could kill that body. Remember what Paul said about Hymenaeus and Philetus? He said, their words doth eat as a canker. Meaning, the wrong words going into your life will eat, just like cancer does, will eat your faith. It'll destroy your faith. It'll eat away at it. It's just like poison in your body being produced by your own DNA because something wasn't transcribed right. Man, this is rich. So again, how does this, how does messenger RNA Now that it's been transcribed, how does it produce insulin? Or how does a Greek or Hebrew Bible, how does that become a saint? How does that become me or you? I mean, how did it work that I heard the word of God preached? It was a uh, missionary to France man by the name of Dennis Teague, missionary to France while I was growing up. I got a chance to meet him when I was in college. He came to a missions conference there, and I said, Dennis, you don't know me, but I said, I'm going to tell you something, and I love doing this. I said, you came to the Missouri camp 1975, and you preached there for two weeks. The second week, no, the first week, that I was there the second night, your preaching, God used you, drew me down to the altar, and I asked Jesus to save me that night. And I, and I told the man, I said, I just want to tell you thank you for your service. No matter what trials you've gone through, no matter what uh, hardships you've had to endure, I want you to know if nobody in France listened to you, A little boy did, and God's changed my life now, and I want to thank you for that. And I'll tell you something. If you ever get a chance, even if I see teachers that I I, I sat in in school, elementary school, high school, if I see them out and about, a lot of them are dead now, but if I see them out and about, if I see them, I tell them, I go to them, you probably don't remember me, but I want to tell you something. You changed my life. Thank you for being a teacher. Thank you for being a preacher. These people, they sacrifice, they give, they change your life. But how does this Greek or Hebrew Bible that I can't understand, how does that create a saint? If God is only in the original manuscripts, how can you and I be saved? This is where the second part comes in called RNA translation. It's what it's called. I didn't make it up. Once the RNA is transcribed, written out, let's say you give out gospel tracts, and those gospel tracts don't have the entire King James Bible in it for everybody, and you don't say, now read the entire Bible, and when you get to the end, if if you're still alive and you believe it, Sign at the end, you're a Christian. No. We know that to draw people and convert them to Christianity does not require the use of the entire Bible. We give them select verses. John 3.16, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10.9 and 10, Ephesians 2.8 and 9, 1 John one nine, we give them these verses. We show them from the scriptures that they are a sinner, that they need to be saved. 
that word goes into them. It, they either reject it because the devil's standing there and he's pulling the word out as soon as it goes in, or they receive it. But then we know that other verses after that must also be applied as they grow and mature as a Christian. More DNA is needed. They're going to, they need the whole book after that. Not all at once, but one day at a time. They need that. But the bottom line is, once it's transcribed, we only give them certain verses to draw them to Christ. But once they're there, or once those verses are transcribed, then they must be translated. They must be put into the form where they can work. And that's what RNA translation is all about. I'm, and the mechanical process, I won't, I won't... But the Bible needs an interpreter. Original Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic languages must have an interpreter. It's the rule that God himself set forth. This is not my rule. I didn't make this up. This is not a church's uh, mandate. This is God himself saying that if it's in one language, it must be interpreted. And it must be interpreted by the Holy Ghost. See, the, the non-King James people will throw stuff at you like, well, you believe in double inspiration. You believe God inspired the originals, then you believe God inspired the King James. That's double inspiration. See, they make this stuff up to try to trap you in a man-made doctrines. And you don't need to fall for this stuff. You, you can say to them, look, I have no idea what you're talking about. Double inspiration. Never heard of that before. But let me tell you what I do believe. I do believe that God inspired the originals. I do believe that God preserved copies of those originals. And I believe the Holy Ghost gives interpretation of tongues that are unknown to me. That's what I believe. And Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek must have one interpreter. You see, the RNA translation process is only done once. The machine that, let's see here, uh, an enzyme called aminoacyl synthetase. Yeah, I'm not even going to get into the technicalities of it. But the idea is, is that this messenger RNA is only translated one time. It's not gone over and something in your body decides that it could be translated a different way. Because think about it. Let's say that you've got in your DNA, it's producing skin cells. Because you need, because 80% of house dust is human skin. Just shed off of us. So you need more skin made. And so the RNA transcription goes out and the machine reads it and then translates it and becomes human skin. Well, what if there was a process in your body where it retranslated it, but it altered it? It altered it in the translation process. So instead of growing skin, now you're growing scales. See, they're different, aren't they? They're both coverings of bodies, but they're not intended. Scales are not intended for us. That's for fish and reptiles and beasts. That's not for us, though. But the, you've got something in your body. Let's say that there's something in your body that retranslates it. And it makes it different. So instead of skin, you're getting scales. Instead of hair, you're getting horns or something like that. No, it's translated one time. And the only way that it can be properly translated. Whoever gives you this nonsense, something's always lost in translation. Whoever gives you that nonsense does not know anything about how your body works. 
if something is really genuinely lost in a translation process, then you'll die. The exact chemical formula for making insulin in my body, the RNA that once it's transcribed is interpreted called RNA translation and it's translated and if it's not translated right, I die. This is critical stuff here. This, but this is how God designed it. Or think of, think of a recipe for Meemaw's cake. Meemaw reads the recipe, and she's the one who builds the cake. Because in any recipe, you not only have the ingredients, but you have the instructions for what to do with those ingredients. It's like, guys, when we get a barbecue grill, we get the parts for it. We get a book. A book tells us how to put together a barbecue grill. And if we, and if that book was written by some guy in China who doesn't know English, you'll never get that stupid thing together. Never. So it's written out exactly what to do with all of the parts that come with it. And you get a list of the parts. But a list of the parts is only half the job. The other half is telling you how to put those parts together. And that also is in your DNA. So your DNA is not just a list of ingredients that makes your the members of your body it also contains the instructions for how those proteins are to be folded and how they're to be manufactured and put together so that they can become the right thing. And my friends, this Bible is not just a list of what's. It is a book of how to. Amen? It's not just a list, as some people think, the essentials for being saved. Just a list of ingredients is all I need. It is the book on how this life, how God wants your life to turn out. Those two always go together. If God gives the instructions for life, God gives the instructions on how to live that life. Because, what did Paul say in 2 Timothy 3.16? All scripture is given by inspiration of God's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and then here it is, for instruction in righteousness. Instruction in righteousness. God telling us how to live. What to do, what not to do. And see, when you accept the Bible for your salvation, you accept all of that with it. You accept that the Bible will correct you. The Bible will reprove you. The Bible will instruct you in righteousness. The Bible will tell you how you are supposed to live. And if you don't want to live that way, then you don't have to accept the Bible. But they go together. Salvation and how to live go together. I'm not teaching a work salvation. What I'm teaching you is, is that when God saves you, God then dictates how you live. And if God is not happy with you at any point of your life, God is going to correct you. God's going to straighten you out. That's the real sign of someone who is born again. The RNA translation process is constantly at work in our lives. He who hath begun a good work in you will continue it. And God is never, in this lifetime, he's never done making us. Never. I do not believe in what some call instant sanctification where once you get saved, you no longer sin ever again. I don't believe that. That's not true according to the scriptures. There is a process that God takes every one of us through 
as he shapes us, as he makes us. He is the potter and we are only the clay. And it is the potter's hands who translates in us how we're to live. Called RNA translation. You remember? They said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? How did Joseph know how to interpret those the baker and the butler's dreams? God gave him the interpretation. The ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. What does that mean? Which is being interpreted. My God, my God. See, watch this now. The same Bible that gives you the instructions gives you the interpretation. 1 Corinthians 12, 10, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. See, there's a part of my body that's really good at transcribing DNA and getting it right. But then there's another part of my body that is exceptional at translating that RNA into the members that become my body. The two are separate, but they are equal gifts given to us by this. The spirit is the DNA. I have this theory that the spirit of man resides in his DNA. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life, right? The words that I speak, the DNA is the book that God spoke, that God speaks in all of us. And it also is where the spirit of man resides. I think it's in his DNA. Alter that DNA. And man's spirit is no longer the spirit of man. It's the spirit of something else. We have the interpretation of tongues. For the body is one and hath many members. And it requires someone who is able to interpret the tongues which come from the Holy Spirit. The languages must be interpreted. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret it. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall the he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at, the giving, at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and that by course, and let one interpret. There must be an interpretation. If this is not translated right, there will be no insulin, but there will be poison. If the instructions are faulty on how to fold those proteins, then your body will not make insulin. That in itself is enough to kill you. But what it makes will be poison. Think of the vine of Sodom. How did Moses reckon it? It's the poison of dragons. The venom of asps. That's what he said. Why? Because it's different words. Different vine. Vine is like DNA. Okay? It's crooked like DNA. That's what vines are. And that vine of Sodom, to me, represents the seed of the serpent. The words that Lucifer says, the words that the devil, the way the devil provokes us and gives us alternate, alternative words. Think about what CRISPR is, people. The CRISPR DNA editing system is alternative words. Let me see if I can um, shift gears here. Let's see here. Let's see if we can pull up how CRISPR works. There we go. This is an article that came out in 2015. New edition of CRISPR promises to make gene therapy ready for human applications. That was three years ago. The article said the potential of CRISPR is to make these rare genetic mutations almost as easy to transfer between humans as cutting and pasting text within Microsoft Word. And I'm telling you, that's how, it, that's how easy it is right now. 
They, they, they imagined in 2015, imagine a world in which humans could see in four colors instead of three. Could voluntarily turn off their sensations of pain. Could feel rejuvenated after just three hours of sleep at night. Possessed extraordinary capacities for oxygen-intensive endurance activities. And had extra-thick bones impervious to osteoporosis. While this may sound like a page out of X-Men, these are all traits contained within the storehouse of rare genetic mutations belonging to the human race. There are people who can already do this. So the speculation is, well, if they can do that, if we could just copy their DNA into others, then they would have that same ability. While the head of the research team, Feng Zhang, cautions that this is not a silver bullet and more testing will need to be done before applying the new technology to humans, it's likely that other more ambitious and perhaps incautious scientists will see things differently. Chinese scientists have already demonstrated a willingness to go off reservation and experiment with CRISPR on human embryos. They're already doing it now. That was three years ago. Here's this article. Just came out. Virus proof human virus proof human cells will they exist within 10 years? Yes, scientists claim. CRISPR pioneers launched project to make ultra safe cells resistant to infections, cancer, aging, and freezing. They intend on producing humans that resist viruses. I have a cold right now. I'm on the tail end of it. The cold is a virus. And a virus, you know what a virus is? It's just a long strand of RNA or DNA. That's all it is. Think about it. Producing humans that are resistant to and viruses are strands of DNA which are words. Making humans resistant to certain words. Ponder that in your mind for a minute. Making humans that are resistant to the gospel and are resistant to the word of God. Am I making this up? No. Let me show you. I had this. Uh, let's just do this in the word of God. Look at the word resist. Um, Acts 751, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Look at that. Romans 13, 2, whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. 2 Timothy 3, 8, now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these, let me underline this, you got to see this, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. There are already people who are resistant to the words that are in the Bible. You know some of these people, don't you? Because you've, you've handed them DVDs. You've sent them links to watch some things I've done or maybe some other preacher's done about the King James issue. You've talked to them until you are blue in the face. You've given them everything that you can from the Word of God itself to try to convince them. And yet, it's just like it just bounces off of them. Something in them, something is in them that makes them resistant to the Word of God. And so now, here we are, we're talking about ways to make people resistant to infections, 
cancer, and aging. Growing old, dying. A leading science group has launched the first large-scale project to develop cells that are resistant to viruses, radiation, freezing, aging, and cancer. The four leaders of the Genome Project, who are among Americans' leading geneticists, insist the endeavor is entirely plausible within a decade. They say it is the first step in the journey to producing ultra-safe cells on demand. Ultra-safe cells could have a major impact on human health, said one of the directors. CRISPR pioneer Professor George Church of Harvard Medical School. A guy named Church is going to change the world. Think of the irony of that. you got to look at this. Professor Church and colleagues at Harvard showed that they could recode the bacteria E. coli. After making 321 changes to the bacterial genome, they could achieve viral resistance. However, recoding the genome of a plant or mammal would be significantly more ambitious. Look at this. Look at this next phrase. Recoding every protein in the human genome, for example, would require 400,000 changes, says Church. Do you remember how many changes there are in the NIV from the King James? Something around 64,000. 64,000 less words in the NIV than there is in a King James. Now you ask yourself the question, would making 64,000 genome changes in a human's G DNA, do you think that that would alter them in such a way as that they would not be classified as human any longer? And yet, we're supposed to believe that you, no matter what Bible translation you read from, you're the same creature, same Christian as anybody else is. 64,000 changes, alterations in the genome of the NIV. And we're supposed to believe that it doesn't make a difference. Recoding is what it's called. Specific redundant codons would have to be removed from all 20,000 human genes. However, the team insists it's doable within 10 years. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The world that we live in right now, in 10 years, changing everybody, changing them from the humanity that they were born in to something entirely different than what they were born with. Now remember, this is how CRISPR works. I'm going through this. I want to show you. This is how the devil has altered the church. The CRISPR itself is a bacteria. And they were looking at this bacteria's DNA and they noted that there were things in the bacteria's DNA that they couldn't figure out had anything to do with the bacteria. I mean, it's a very simple organism, and it had a certain amount of genes in it, and they figured out what all the genes did in this one bacteria, but then <coughs> it had all these other genetic things in it, and they said, we don't know what this is. Then they realized... There are certain viruses in the world that only target certain bacteria. So I'm using this Batman scenario. All the, all the bad guys in Batman, like the Joker. So let's say here's the average citizen of Gotham City. And here is a virus that only attacks people from Gotham City. Because the Joker never the Joker never shows up in Metropolis where Superman lives. It's always in Gotham. Okay. 
Well, they found out that this virus or this bacteria actually carried a copy of the bad virus's DNA in its own genome. In other words, it had a picture of its of the only bad guy that could kill it. It was carrying a genetic picture of the Joker. So, whenever this bacteria was being attacked by this particular virus, this bacteria knew how to recognize it because it carried a copy of this virus's DNA and it knew how to destroy it. So CRISPR would send out an RNA strand that matches the Joker. See, here's the, here's the Riddler, here's Mr. Freeze, here's the Joker, here's the Penguin, here's Cat Girl or Catwoman or whatever, and here is, I don't know who this guy is. So it's got a copy of the Joker's DNA. It goes looking at its own genome, and if it finds the virus attached to it, then this bacteria uses an enzyme called Cas9. And Cas9 does one thing. It cuts DNA. So Cas9, picture Cas9 as the scissors or the knife. Cas9 then would cut out, see the, the, the virus would attach itself to the bacteria's own DNA. But the CRISPR bacteria would then recognize that virus in its own genome and say, uh, this doesn't belong here. And it would send out an enzyme called Cas9, and Cas9 would cut that out and discard it. So the scientists got to looking at that, and they said, you know what? What if we reprogram the CRISPR bacteria to, instead of looking for this particular virus's DNA, I wonder if we could implant some other form of DNA into this CRISPR bacteria. And we wonder if when it had a copy of this, could it scan the genome of a living creature, find that particular DNA sequence and cut it out using the Cas9 scissors. They found out not only did it did it, did it do it, but it did it nearly perfectly every time. And it's like it doesn't cost very much money at all. So now people can buy a kit with an E. coli bacteria in it and for 25 bucks you can teach yourself the art of genome editing. I'm I'm not making this up. It's how simple it is. Where did they get the idea from? They got the idea from Westcott and Hort who decided that they didn't like the things that were in the King James Version of the Bible because they were assigned to revise the King James Bible, the King's Bible, by the king himself. The king said West, to Westcott and Hort, we want you to revise the King's Bible, update the language. Well, they took it way farther than they ever we're going to, they didn't just revise the language. They altered the text because they saw things in the King James that they didn't like. So they set about to significantly alter the King's Bible. And then the revised version. And then after that, the New American Standard, the NIV, the the I call it the Holman Christian Standard. Now they're, they've remarketed it and called it the Christian Standard Bible. The Southern Baptists now are broadening out their market. So instead of just selling their Bible to Southern Baptists, they're selling their Bible to everybody. And their marketing strategy, I kid you not, it's called True North. And if you take the word North and run it through the Bible, you're going to find a lot of places where the, you know what? Joel 
refers to the army that invades as the northern army. They're coming out of the, the evil nor the evil army. Uh, the evil army is coming out of the north. Okay. Job nineteen two. How long will you vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? Do do alternative words have an effect? On a person's life? The answer is yes. Here is someone who we would call a new convert. Now, if they're truly born again, God is going to protect them. But if they're these temporary believers, they believe for a while, but then alternative words come at them. And it chokes the real word of God out. And just like CRISPR, it cuts out parts of the Bible that that person doesn't like or that would produce good fruit in that person and replaces it with corruption. This is exactly what's going on in this world, people. We're walking in the next 10 years, if that long. We're marching into the world. You and I, in our lifetime, are going to see a generation of people transformed right in front of our very eyes. We're going to see it in our lifetime. If I live to be 90 and the Lord tarries his coming, we're going to see this thing happen. Look at the difference. The word was God or the word was a God. Jehovah's Witness, they saw something in the King James they didn't like. So what they do? They added to it. They added one letter. Changed the entire verse. Changed the deity of Christ instantly by adding one letter. A one letter word. A the word was a God. The fourth is like a son of God, or like the son of God, or a son of the gods. They took out the son of God, and they crisper edited and replaced with a son of the gods. In Swahili, they add one letter from Moana wa Mungu to Moana wa Miungu. They add one letter. Mungu is changed to Miungu. Mungu, God, singular. Miungu, God's plural. One letter changed in Swahili. And it alters the entire text. It alters who is in that fiery furnace. Is he the son of God or a son of gods? Plural gods. One letter alters the text. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Or how you have fallen from heaven, morning star. Crisper cuts out, O Lucifer, and then rewrites it to Morning Star. But the Morning Star is Jesus. Yep. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. So, there really are two camps here. Two vines. Those who follow the King James and vernacular translations that are based upon the majority text or the received text, that's vine one. Vine two 
are the vine of Sodom. Those that come from the Sinaiticus of Vaticanus. Those Greek Bibles and every other vernacular translation that follows the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus Greek text. Two groups. Two different species of Christians. Their seed, my friend, if one letter can alter someone's entire perception of who Jesus is from John 1.1, 1, 1, what can thousands, thousands of omissions, um, re, re, rewording, replacement words, take, words taken out, words added to, into the thousands of times between the majority text and the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. They are two different creatures from two different seeds. And those seeds are not the same. They do not come from the same place. And those who follow after them, they are of a different sort. They don't like us. We don't like them. We're supposed to love them, and we try to, but we don't get along. And they say it as easily as we say it. The Word was made flesh. Whatever was in the DNA comes out, is manifested. Whatever that DNA was, that's what's produced. DNA becomes a living creature, flesh. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. Some of them, some flesh has scales. Some has fur. Some have horns on their body. All flesh is not the same flesh. It is determined by what the seed says in it. How that, how that DNA is translated, how that DNA is transcribed, it makes a difference in what the creature turns out to be. Evil communications corrupt good manners, the Word of God says. And whatever evil communications, I mean, just think about it. They took our Bible, and they took all these things out, and then they rewrote a bunch of verses to fit what they thought and what they believed. That has produced the changes that you and I are seeing in churches everywhere. That's what did it. <coughs> It was, the, it was the word and the spirit that was behind those words. That's what made that change. Colossians 2, 3, In whom are hid are all the, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Enticing words meant to cut away and replace God's words in your mind and heart. 2 Timothy 2.17, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It makes a difference, people. This preacher is going to say this as long as God allows me breath to say it. The word that you read, the word that you believe, the word that you receive, it makes a difference what those words are. It makes a difference in what fruit those seeds produce. 
to every seed his own body. If it's if it's the Quran, the Quran does not produce born again Christians. The Quran produces militant Muslims. If it's the Bhagavad Gita, it produces Hindus. If it's the King James Bible, it produces King James Bible believers. If it's the NIV, the New World Translation, the New American Standard, the Christian Standard, or whatever, the True North Version, or whatever it is, then the creature that is produced from that looks like the seed that went into it. And it makes a difference if that seed is different. And that difference doesn't have to be much. The difference between humans and monkeys, chimpanzees, it's like a 3% difference in their DNA. That's all it is. Doesn't sound like much. But it makes the difference. My whole life is spent on letting God give me ways to show you. I didn't. I didn't show you what I was going to show you today. You'll have to. You'll have to wait till the next Watchman, uh, the Ultimate King James Code. You'll have to wait and see what God showed me. It was, oh, you'll love it. You'll love it. Okay? I got to go. We're going to get ready for tonight. Come join us tonight, 7 o'clock. Pastor Reg Kelly, Chris Pinto in the house, getting ready to preach the Word of God. Show us the way of the Word, the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. You come be with us tonight. Join us. We had a, we had a, decent crowd last night here but our online crowd is over a thousand computers logged on watching our service last night let's see if we can get more of you all right we'd love to love to have you be a part of this we are recording these and uh we're gonna have to do some editing and then we'll get them out it'll probably be next week all right you're the reason why we do what we do and if i can convince somebody to put down those other bibles Pick up a King James. Believe it. Then my life is worth something. I hope it's worth something to you. God bless you. We'll see you.